Welcome, it's really lovely to see you here at Freelance Features. Um, my name is Richard Watts. I'm a 52 year old, oh, I'm a 53 year old white man with short hair and clear glasses who had his birthday just the other day. And I'm going to be hosting this session um, with you all um, this evening. I'm going to um, start by saying a little bit about the programme and about how we're hoping we might all work together. And then I'll be handing over to my colleague, Sandeep Mahal, who will be chairing the panel this evening. Um, so first of all, I'd like to say that this event is part of Freelance Futures, and that's a summer programme of learning and action for equitable conditions in culture. And before we go further, I just wanted to outline some access and other important information. So this evening, Cheryl is our captioner. And to access captions, you can click on the CC closed captions button. Um, if you, we also um, have BSL interpretation this evening. And of course, that will be embedded in the recorded version of this evening's session. Rebecca and Bev are providing BSL interpretation today. And Freelance Futures is a call for collective learning and action to build equitable conditions for freelancers working in culture. And we know it will take all our efforts to affect real change. So we welcome all your insights and experiences as independent practitioners, practitioners working within cultural organisations, unions, funding bodies and policymakers. Given that we need all of us, um, this is our basic code of conduct for today. Please respect and value your collaborators in this room. Be aware of your privilege, know when to make space and when to take space. Avoid overcomplicated language and uh, explain any technical terms. And um, of course, we're all at different stages in our learning. So we'd ask that you respect the person and challenge the idea. This is a relaxed environment and it's being recorded in order that people can watch this panel whenever it's most convenient for them to do. So feel free to access this event in any way that makes participating work for you. If possible, we'd like to start with your video options switched on just to welcome the speakers and contributors, but we understand that that might not work for you. And finally, in terms of this kind of introduction uh, conversation. I um, wanted to say that we are recording this session um, for others to, um, uh, to access throughout the Freelance Futures programme. And today, this panel will be a little bit more broadcast. If you do want to talk to each other or uh, explore ideas, then we've created a social platform Mighty Networks, and you can access that from the community link within the Freelance Futures website. So, um, having described that bit, and now it's now my lovely duty to just orientate us a little bit to the Freelance Futures program. And so, this is day two of Freelance Futures, and during um, this time together. Our intention is that we're working together to um, create more equitable conditions within the cultural sector. We've got three phases to this work. We're in part one at the moment, started yesterday. That's about getting informed, resourced and connected. So hearing about what other people are doing, reading reports that already exist, getting to understand some of the issues, um, or communicate those issues to others that maybe don't understand so well. The second phase is perhaps a little bit more of a kind of traditional uh, format. So that's an online gathering across a week from the 13th to the 17th of June. And there's most days there's four events, a wellbeing event, a panel, a discussion, 
some other um, interaction in each of those five days. And then the third phase is really about recognizing that the, the work's not done till we've put it into action. So we wanted to create some time for us all to be thinking about how we might make change within our organizations. So to kind of drill down slightly into the program a little bit more, I just wanted to recognize that we've created these four themes because there's such a broad range of people who are joining us today and joining us across this program. So there's a strand of work called Organising Together as a Sector, um, which is about supporting us to be heard, to create uh, an effect and um, to make change. There's a second strand of work called Understanding Freelancer Rights and Resources. There's a third that's focused more on policy making and supporting change in the conditions. And there's a fourth that's about organisational change. And this session today is focused a bit more on that organisational change element. So before we hear from the panel, I just wanted to introduce um, a toolkit that we've created um, that you'll find on the Freelance Futures website in the resources section. Or if you go to this event on the website, you'll see a link through to the toolkit. So the toolkit is a simple, um, a simple six-step process to support each of us in creating change in uh, the organisations that we work in or with. And the principle of, of, the, of uh, Freelance Futures is that we ask that each of us bring our ecosystem to this conversation. So who are the people that need to be in a conversation with you in order that change happens in the organizations that you work in or with. So the first stage in the toolkit suggests that we spend some time building an understanding of the conditions as they are experienced by others. So understanding reports, drawing insights for yourself. The second stage, is about building your ecosystem, inviting others into freelance futures to explore and experience some of these ideas with you in order that you make change with them. So that might be freelancers that you work with often if you're in an organisation, or it might be other colleagues like HR colleagues or producers within your organization who needs to be involved in this conversation in order to create more equitable conditions for freelance workers. It might be funders, might be policymakers, it might be unions. Invite them to be in this conversation. And then if we're going back to that toolkit, the next thing we'd ask you to do is to ask that ecosystem to evaluate the impact of your organization on freelance workers today. So take a really honest look at where your strengths are and where you might want to make change. Following that, there's a piece of work that we think you might want to do during this nine week stretch, where you decide some priority actions together. You might want to wait until that five day more intensive sessions happened and you've heard more about what others have been doing create change, um, create and embed that change, not just at the level of commitment, but at the level of culture. And then the final stage of the toolkit is suggesting that you might want to then set some new ambitions that take you beyond the change you've already created. So from my perspective, hopefully you have a sense of the way that we're thinking about um, this um, program, who we're asking you to invite into this space together and the kind of work that you might be doing to evaluate with others, uh, create change, embed that change in organisations that you're in or you work with. So I think it's enough talk about that and let's hear from some individuals and organisations that have been thinking about creating more equitable experiences for freelance workers and other colleagues and I'm going to call on my brilliant colleague, Sandeep Mahal, to uh, chair that panel. Over to you, Sandeep.
Thanks so much, Richard, and welcome to everyone watching. Um, I'm Sandeep Mahal, and I'm the Director of Sector Change here at People Make It Work. I'm a 44-year-old brown woman with long, dark hair, and I celebrated my son's 18th birthday over the weekend. Um, we are joined by a lovely panel of stellar people working in our industry in a variety of different roles, and who have been actively refining um, their ways of working to address freelancer conditions. We have Becky Chapman, Akina Aquino, Lily Einhorn and Sarah Hopwood. So to explain how this panel discussion is going to work, um, first of all, I will invite each panelist to introduce themselves and speak about the work they are doing to create more equitable conditions for freelancers. We'll then be in conversation and draw on their journeys and experiences and offer some insights from what they've heard during this discussion and the choices they are now making that will inform their future priorities. We really hope the discussion will support um, your thinking and conversations about the tools, resource, uh, resources and leadership you might call on to help frame the choices, the actions you make about freelancer <clears throat> working conditions. And we'd really encourage your reflections and questions on what you've heard. So please pop them on the social platform, the Mighty Networks, which you can find on the Freelance Futures website. Um, so we'll kick off, uh, shall we, by asking the panel to introduce themselves, their role, um, organisation and practice, and to tell us a bit about the work that they've been doing to create more equitable conditions for freelancers. And if we could start with Becky. Hello, Becky. Hi. Uh, I'm Becky Chapman. I am a middle-aged white woman with glasses sitting in my home office. Um, I'm executive director of Diverse City. And Diverse City is a Dorset-based uh, national performing arts company. And we work at the intersection of cultural and social justice. So we, are, we make work, we tour work, at the moment touring in venues, but we also tour outdoors. And we make work with companies of people that bring deaf, disabled and non-disabled artists together to make and perform. Um, we've been an MPO since 2018 um, and we are, um, we employ about a full-time equivalent uh, PAYE staff of about nine people and we probably employ, last year was a bit odd obviously, um, last few years a bit odd, but uh, we, we usually employ upwards of 50 freelancers a year can be as many as a hundred it really varies depending on the project um, and we have a, a flagship partnership um, project called extraordinary bodies and we run that with a fantastic um, company circus company so uh, um, called Cirque du Jour, and that so a lot of our work is um, circus based and actually if you want to know more about extraordinary bodies we're on the one show tonight can you believe it seven o'clock catch it um, little plug, sorry. But we are um, disability and female led. And I think what that means for us is that in terms of our approach to more equitable conditions for freelancers, is that we really approach that through the lens of the social model of disability. Now, we're not the only company doing this and we are not definitely not the company doing it the best um, all the time, but it is really central to the way that we approach um, employment practice, working practice throughout the company, both for freelancers and for uh, people on uh, contracts like me. It's really fundamental to how we work. Um, and so I mean, just to explain that a little bit for anyone who's, who doesn't know about the social model of disability, and I'll do it very briefly, but do please find out more about it. Um, because there's lots of uh, really great people uh, writing and talking about it. But the social model of disability um, essentially argues that uh, people are not disabled by their impairments. 
um, but people are disabled by their environment and therefore it is not disabled people that need fixing but it is the environment that needs adjustment and fixing and of course the people who are the most expert in deciding what kinds of adjustments environments need are of course disabled people um so when we take that as a kind of starting point in terms of employment it's a fairly short leap um it's a step really to understand what might flow from that which is of course this the idea that we're all experts in what works best for us in terms of how we do our best work and it's really liberating <laughs> both as a, an employee and an employer, um, and I think liberating for a lot of the freelancers that we work with, to be approached really uh, by an employer in, as a negotiation, a contract of employment is really a negotiation. So any um, job offer or employment that we um, uh, offer is a negotiation with a freelancer. And I guess, what that sort of looks like is that it means that um, there's a negotiation about where you work. We don't have a central office. Um, we all work from where suits us best. Um, Jamie Bedard, who is an employee, he works out of London. Um, we're based in Swanage, where our um, co-artistic director, co-artistic director with Jamie Clare works. Our tour booker freelance works out of Scotland. Um, we have freelancers in Swindon, in Bristol, in Brighton. We have, you know, we're very, very distributed. And so people, freelancers and employees are invited to work where suits them. And obviously, as soon as you are able to work where you, what's, where, where suits you, you are able to control that environment to a large extent. Um, but obviously that extends into how you work and when you work. And that means that we're really, really driven by the principle of flexibility. So if you need to work at seven o'clock in the morning till 10, that's when you work. If you need to work in the evening, that's when you work. If you need to take a break at three to do pick up, if you need to leave in the middle of the day to go to the hospital, if you need to, if you've got caring responsibilities that mean you're, you're sometimes a bit unpredictable um, in terms of your working hours, you're, you know, that is absolutely um critical to your employment with us and i guess at root i mean what we want is for people to bring their whole self to their work we don't want jobs that um mold people we want people to mold their job um i think i mean obviously critically that also means that people are offered support if they need it um i mean a lot of people that we work with who are disabled have um access to um personal assistants, or obviously BSL interpreters, um, audio describers, but also if you need assistance in any other way, whether it's about the pace that you work or whether it's about the equipment that you need, we really try and put that in place. And that does, you know, that is across the board, freelancer, employee. Um, I think that the shift then starts to happen with this negotiation in terms of our contracting of freelancers. So the, the freelancer has, determines the nature of a lot of their conditions of employment and also the the way in which they approach their work and therefore the question is always you know have you got what you need have you got enough capacity do you need more support are you actually um, you know you don't need to pretend it's okay if it's not and if you feel overwhelmed you must say and of course that's been pretty vital during the pandemic you know, when we've offered freelancers and employees quite a lot of additional mental well-being support. And, um, you know, that's been really taken up massively across the board. Um, I guess the other thing is, and it's a sort of bit of a mind shift is, or a, a, a sort of head shift, which is, you know, we feel we're part of a freelancer's journey. We're part of a freelancer's business as much as they're a part of our business and a part of our journey. And that exchange and that sense of sort of mutuality, I think, is really critical. Um, 
I guess overarchingly, what is marvellous and, and really liberating about the social model of disability and where it's taken this, us is that it's, it's radical because it's about um, uh, really transforming the norm, you know, really uh, understanding and confronting the idea that business as usual doesn't serve us, has never served me as a, as a freelancer or an employee. You know, the structures that I've worked in my whole career have been made by people for whom, um, who, who have a completely different um, life and life experience. And, and I'm not going to put up with any more for myself or for anyone else. Um, and I really think that, you know, adjustments to the norm should be the norm. Um, I've already said, you know, we want people to bring all their, their whole selves to work in all their complexity, because it makes the work better. And, it, you know, if we're about anything in the arts, it's about humanity. So it's hard to argue against it, really. And I don't think it's any accident that we're hearing a lot of middle-aged white men decrying working from home at the moment, to be honest, because I just think it serves them. Not all of them, of course, but a lot of the people that we hear from they are served by a particular structure and I really am absolutely um, passionate about um, overturning that. Um, you know, the whole of the senior team in the company models that, uh, leads that, and, um, and I think that we really, yeah, I think that we're, we're beginning to really embrace it every day in a wider and wider way. Um, I think I've probably had my seven minutes, Sandy, but if I've got a time, I just wanted to, if I've got time just to read a little quote that someone shared with me the other day, if that's okay. This is from a freelance, um, a fantastic freelancer we work with, and we've worked with her for about a year or so, just a couple of years. She said to me recently, I've built a career predominantly in disability arts sector, and yet I've tried to hide this side of myself in order to be more professional, I've been convinced that if I shared how hard I find some aspects of my job that I wouldn't get work and it would break the trust I've built with the teams I work with. Thank you for creating a company where I feel safe to begin to remove the mask. Thank you so much, Becky. What an uplifting start. I love hearing where the social model of a disability has taken you. I love the geographic diversity of diversity and the opportunity that has opened up for you in terms of the voices and experts that have been enabled because of the flexible working conditions, because of the equipment and access you've enabled um, and, and creating the space to ask those vital questions of need, of capacity and, and support. So thank you. Um, we'll go to Akina next. Hello, Akina. Hi, Sandy, and uh, hello, everyone. It's it's really lovely to be speaking at this panel. So thank you to yourself, Sandeep, and, and Richard for ha having us all here today. Um, I'm a Southeast Asian woman with short, dark hair, and I'm wearing uh, gold hoops and a white shirt. My name is Akina Kino, and I'm a project manager uh, working in the advocacy strand with Ink Arts. So we champion the creative, economic, and contractual rights of the UK's ethnically diverse and, and cultural workforce. And I work to support the development of projects that respond to the lack of diversity in the sector. So uh, a major project that we've been working on recently, um, some might know it is, is Arts Against Racism, which is a long-term campaign built in partnership with What Next. And it aims to create a national response to anti-racism and inclusion that is fit for purpose. Uh, across the arts sector, and it affects both contracted and freelance workers. Uh, so the, the projects that we work on are often very, very much informed by the work that we've done in the past. And, and many of the elements in this campaign are informed by the, the findings from our past conferences. So for example, back all the way back in November 2020, we hosted an anti-racism conference called Speak, Listen, Reset, Heal, where uh, sector leaders came together to hear firsthand experiences of uh, racism from 400 
Black, Asian, and ethnically diverse lens workers from all across the UK and all across creative practices. I think, I think there were 3,000 participants in total attending. Um, so after that conference, we, we took action on, on the gap that we saw between those of lived experiences and those who wanted to be active allies. Uh, we took the statements of solidarity, the demands for pledges and promises to take action, and we turned those into measurable actions as a clear way of engaging usefully and systematically with anti-racist practice. Um, so the outcome of, of this work uh, and this process was really unlock, which is what I wanted to share with everyone today. It's, it's an inclusive accountability framework. Uh, and this framework is an interactive online system and it allows organizations and individuals to chart and track their own actions when they're creating um, their plans to make anti-racist change. Uh, and just a little bit more about the platform, it provides about 180 or more so very clear and measurable actions on how to create inclusive workplaces and, and work teams and these actions are broken down into three categories. So we have hire, we have work and care, and the third is leadership. Through this toolkit, organizations can create their own action plans and set themselves time scales for how long they want to take in implementing the actions that they've chosen. And through the process of building this toolkit, we wanted to make sure that the actions are both inclusive of and responsive to the lived experiences of ethnically diverse freelancers, as well as uh, full-time and contracted staff. Despite being quite a large part of the arts work workforce, we felt that um, we are very aware how they can be easily overlooked in the anti-racist practices of organizations. And excluding freelancers in this work could mean that they don't have access to anti-racist training, given by the organizations that they don't have access to um, a reliable outlet or, or method of properly raising concerns. Um, and maybe overall that there is no transparent process for monitoring the treatment of freelancers as they're often um, fleeting, they'll, they'll come and they'll go as the nature of, of the role. So in all these three categories of the Unlock Toolkit, we made sure that we had actions that directly focused on ensuring freelancers were considered and included. So for example, in the higher category, we encourage organizations to publish transparent pay schemes for all of their organization, including freelancer rates. Uh, you can choose uh, where they are wanting to create monthly forums for staff to air concerns and issues. We've included that in this action. They should make this accessible to freelancers also, visiting staff and touring companies. In the work and care category, uh, we have an action for breaking the cycles of, of always being a project worker um, by encouraging organizations to create a transparent process for moving freelancers that they regularly work with into staff jobs if they would like to make that move. Um, and as a part of their staff training offer, freelancers should be included in the provision of, of training opportunities. Uh, very similarly, in, in our last category, which was leadership, we, we have an action where uh, we ask that they provide paid for training opportunities for all freelancers that the organization works with for more than three months a year. And when they do a annual, if they would like to do an annual 360 feedback appraisal on all senior leadership roles, um, this feedback process should also include freelancers. So all in all, the Unlock Toolkit gives Incards a picture of what the sector is doing um, to create better conditions for their ethnically diverse workforce, including and sometimes especially for freelancers. Um, and so providing a method of monitoring we can get a better picture of what areas of improvements there are, and we can keep organizations accountable for the progress that they pledge to make. We think Unlock works, um, we think Unlock as a toolkit um, will be vital to encourage more organizations in the sector to take those measurable actions that I was talking about through this platform. Um, and we have a lot more to do, as um, we know the work is never really done. 
the development uh, for unlock now falls under the Arts Against Racism campaign that I mentioned a little earlier in the monetary strand. And in the next development stage for unlock, we'll be partnering with One Dance UK um, and Watershed to share their methodology and their knowledge um, for their balance and belonging project. So we're pairing up with them to develop a cross-sector task force. Um, and this partnership will take a, a pretty multidisciplinary approach to developing these resources further for the cultural sector around anti-racism and, and data-led inclusion. Um, we'll also be working on developing Unlock's capabilities to be able to produce reports. And this is for organizations of internal use uh, for their own insights and, and also a public report which shows the progress of the entire sector as a whole. Ultimately, we're, we are aiming for this, this toolkit, this accountability framework to empower organizations to create those more equitable inclusion, uh, equitable conditions rather for all. Um, yeah, wow. I feel like I, I buzzed through that very quickly, but I'm passing back over to you, Sandy. Thank you so much, Akina, um, for sharing how organizations can proactively create positive change um, through this transparent um, process for uh, clear, measurable action with and for ethnically um, diverse freelancers. And it was brilliant and fascinating to hear how that toolkit will be further developed. Um, thank you. Um, so we'll go to Lily next. Hello, Lily. Hi, uh, thank you. Very nice to be here. Um, I'm a 41 year old white woman with brown hair, uh, dark glasses, pink lipstick, and probably a slightly dazed expression uh, on my face as I stare into my Zoom camera. Um, so yeah, my name is Lily Einhorn. I'm a community arts practitioner, consultant, and coach. And I'm here in my capacity as the curator and manager of the East London Freelance Network, which is funded by Stratford East. Um, I'll give you a little bit of background into how this network came about. Um, like many freelancers, I lost all of my work at the start of the pandemic in a matter of days. And Stratford East was one of the organizations that reached out to the freelancers that had been working with them over the last few years. And I'd just produced um, a community opera with them in 2019. Um, and they started um, holding semi-regular meetings about once a month in order to keep us in the loop, to keep us freelancers who were really out on a limb uh, in the loop about what was going on in the industry when we thought the pandemic was only gonna last a few weeks. Um, and they were really invaluable at the same time, a couple of weeks later, Fuel launched the Freelance Task Force. Stratford East put out an open application to their current and past freelancers, and I got the role to become their sponsored freelancer on the task force. And as a result of that, I became more involved in those meetings that Stratford East was running. Um, as that came to an end, they applied for CRF, the Cultural Recovery Fund from the Arts Council funding, and they put money in for freelancers. And Eleanor Lang, the executive director, and Nadia Fall, the AD, artistic director, invited me to run um, a network for freelancers with a budget. And I think the really radical thing about this was that they handed it over to me, a freelancer, to run what I thought was best for my fellow freelancers and peers. So we expanded the network, it became the East London Freelancers Network. Um, and the idea was that it would be for anyone um, working and living in East London in any capacity in the performing arts. Um, so the first thing I did was send out a survey because my instinct is always to ask people what they want and not just be top down. And what was really interesting about that was that Nobody wanted to be surveyed anymore. <laughs> there have been a lot of surveys over the last two years. Um, I know I have done one of them and they are very valuable. Um, and what actually people really wanted was to be offered things. Um, so I think informed by my work on the freelance task force and by being on the advisory board for creative freelancers and the incredible work that the cohort did there, um, I started to program the network for them. So I started to think about what do freelancers not get that salaried workers and people embedded in organizations get beside the salary, um, besides the salary and sick pay uh, and pensions. Um, and I think there are three things that this comes down to. One is community, 
because you don't have a green room, you don't have an office, you don't have shared meetups, or even if in a pandemic, you don't have a coming together, a, a regular coming together. The other is CPD, so continuing professional development, things like first aid training, safeguarding, anti-racism training, the kind of things that Akina was talking about. Um, and the other is to be fed culturally by your organisation. So those offers of tickets that come in or tickets for other organisations or simply those conversations that you have with your colleagues about what you saw or what's going on. So those are the three things that I set out to provide with this network. Um, we um, provided community by having general meetings. I hold a general meeting once a month, which are kind of like coffee mornings, and also having a very um, deliberate, relaxed and informal atmosphere. It's breastfeeding friendly, it's child friendly, it's uh, fire alarm going off friendly. Um, and I've deliberately told people that they can attend the meetings in whatever way they see fit, if they need to lie down or stand up or have their cameras on and off. Um, the second part was the CPD. So I've run um, all sorts of things from um, taxation for freelancers. We've got how to build your own website coming up next week, um, anti-racism training, anti-ableism training, um, sessions on body language for Zoom, which I probably should have paid more attention to, um, sessions on values. And then the final one was the, the kind of cultural food. I can't provide free tickets to anything. Um, so instead, we had things like creative writing, we had poetry writing for non-writers. Suzanne Elaine came on and did a talk on her amazing work on the neurology of power. Um, and a lot of those kinds of things are the things that people in salaries are getting, but freelancers have to pay for in order to access and they need to feed them culturally in order to do their best work. Um, there were a couple of other things that, that I did deliberately on the network. I only engaged people who were freelance to deliver sessions so that we were, we were paying people who were freelance. And absolutely no one was allowed to do anything without being paid uh, to eliminate unpaid labour. Um, and I think ultimately freelancers, we need a share of power and resources. We need more sustainable working practices of the kind that Becky was talking about. But I hope that at least it's been a helpful drop in, in a much wider ocean. <laughs> I'll hand back to you, Sandy. Thank you, Lily. I just, that devolution of power and budget, I just love that. <laughs> And the insight that you've um, garnered from your um, consultation, the three things that you've offered, community, CPD, cultural food, I feel like that's something every place can respond to. Um, thank you. Uh, so we'll go to um, Sarah next. Hello, Sarah. Hi, uh, I'm Sarah Hopwood. I am a white, middle-aged, probably that's being generous, 60-year-old woman. Uh, with grey shoulder length hair and glasses um, and it's a privilege to have been invited to contribute to this panel today. Um, I work at a wonderful opera house in South Downs, Glyndebourne. Um, we're a charity with a mission to enrich as many people's lives as possible through opera and we do this by investing in a summer festival. We're due to open on Saturday which is very exciting and the summer festival takes place at Glyndebourne. We have an annual tour that goes around the country. Um, it's more than a week in each venue. We're working on residencies in those areas throughout the year. We have a year round learning and engagement program. Um, and then we invest in digital content to take our work to the broadest possible audience. I'm going to say something now that probably is blindingly obvious, but I think it's embarrassing to some of us in organizations that it took a pandemic to realize this. And I think the experience of the past two years has really highlighted the financial vulnerability of freelancers and the imbalance between freelancers and organisations. And I'm also embarrassed that it was the freelancers themselves who did much of the work in bringing this data to our attention. Um, it's obvious we're all dependent on each other. At Glyndebourne, approximately a third of our workforce are freelance and we can no longer ignore the problem. So um, just very short term fix during uh, uh, over the past 20 years, we've built up reserves. We have very generous donations throughout the pandemic 
and with the help of the government furlough scheme, we avoided having to make permanent staff redundant. But we were very, very conscious of the absolutely disastrous impact on freelancers and on seasonal staff who lost their work over overnight. I think it was Becky that, uh, or, or maybe Lily, who who referred to that. Um, and we 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 were very we we. So we took the short term fix of thinking um, we went out specifically to raise money to say to our donors, we need to find a way of getting financial support for every single person who is contracted with Blindborn in any single capacity. But it really kickstarted our thinking in what can we do to contribute to thinking about the long term sustainability for freelancers in the culture sector. So I think we're working very hard in three specific areas. We've launched a Glyndebourne Freelancer Fund. We've made a deliberate um, decision. We've ring-fenced half a million pounds, which is 10% of our freelancer bill for 2022. And I've been working with a small group of freelancers who work regularly at Glyndebourne um, to say, how might this fund be most beneficial to support freelancers in times of need? And there are the obvious ones, the sickness, compassionate leave, maternity, paternity. But the really interesting ideas that came up from the freelancers is that period where freelancers have been out of work for whatever reason, it's getting match fit again. It's what do they need in terms of physical support, the money to open up that physical support, vocal coaching, physio, whatever that might be, um, and to rebuild confidence. training, which again was referred to earlier, and career development, really important for long-term sustainability. So we now have a process in place, it's been approved by the board. In fact, we've had our first payment made through our freelancer fund, which is fantastic. And we're deliberately keeping it as broad as possible for this first pilot year, as we decide on how we move forward. So the second very deliberate thing we're doing, and again, it feels obvious, but it's taken a pandemic to do it. And I think the very fact that we're all participating in this debate, I think more joined up thinking across the sector between freelancers, organisations and the government. So in collaboration with Creative UK, we've established a steering group, which is including participants from arts organisations, both charitable and commercial. We have a human rights lawyer. We have a professor from the law faculty at Sussex University. And we're looking at how we can achieve long-term systemic change to ensure financial sustainability for those who are choosing to pursue a freelance career in the culture sector. We're also hoping to contribute to the DCMS sector vision. So in the short term, we recognise not all organisations have the reserves to establish a freelancer fund, but we do need, in collaboration with freelancers and government, to be, to be establishing ways of giving freelancers the same security long term that employees enjoy, um, to include financial support in times of need, but also in planning for older age. And as an example of the things we can do right now, we're considering the drafting of a code of conduct, hopefully with recognised accreditation, for organisations to sign up to in working with freelancers. And this might include, we're in the very early stages of this, but committing to sign up to the Living Wage Foundation. We then have to think through what that might mean. How can this be applied to those freelancers earning a lump sum fee for their work rather than that based on hours, weeks or performances? And what other areas should be included as minimum best practice, including performance review, development, payment on termination, for example? Um, We also, recognising this costs money, but it feels very inequitable that at the moment there is no equivalent to the employee contributory auto-enrolment pension scheme. And again, that's an area we want to explore. So finally, working in specific partnerships um, with other organisations whose mission is to support freelancers in the culture sector. So SWOPRA, um, a charity supporting women and parents in opera, was established to find ways to champion and generate more opportunities for women in senior and creative roles in classical music, and to dismantle the outdated attitudes towards the compatibility of parenthood and a career in the sector. The Glyndebourne's providing support to enable SWAPRA 
to launch a brand new retreat for mothers in the process of returning to their singing careers after a period of maternity leave. The, the initial pilot is going to be a four day retreat to take place at Glyndebourne next spring, which will include master classes, vocal coaching, Pilates, and a filmed recording of a couple of prepared arias with the intention of rebuilding stamina and confidence for these freelance women for whom this sort of support would normally be prohibitively expensive. Hopefully this will provide a useful trial in establishing how we can effectively share existing resources and facilities in a way that's consistent with our charitable objectives. And it's hopefully an example of ways in which organizers and freelancers can collaborate to build greater sustainability for the future. So I will finish there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah. I am just feeling so buzzed by all this brilliant embedded practice, um, the new initiatives that have emerged and the toolkits and resources that will continue to serve um, the sector. So thank you so much for bringing your bringing to life your case studies um, and, and the emerging work and, and pilots. Um, I just want to have a panel discussion now around some of the things you've heard during this panel um, and whether there's anything you'd like to explore more further or, or reinforce more. And, and do feel free, um, Becky, Akina, uh, Lily and Sarah to just unmute yourself if there are anything further you'd like to explore from what you've just heard. I just, um, I just jumping very quickly. I mean, I, I just, I think that what you're describing, Sarah, is really interesting, and and particularly this idea of, um, I mean, you know, as you said, lots of companies do not have the reserves that you're talking about, but that idea of moving towards a point where, I mean, we have a building resilience reserve, obviously as a company, but we, it doesn't encompass the freelance workforce. And I think it's about thinking differently about that um, that building of reserves, I think is really interesting idea. And it's one that, you know, customer and practices, you know, you have your three months winding up, winding, winding down, winding up costs and your, you know, but you, <clears throat> but I think that it's a really important shift to think about reserves differently. Um, and yeah, it makes me a bit, uh, we've made a reserves decision recently and I'm just thinking, oh, that was a mistake. So I thought that was really interesting what you said. And um, and also, I mean, we've done quite a lot of work around um, not so much returning mothers, although I guess, well, I suppose perhaps indirectly we have, but um, just sustaining um, particularly parents, not just mothers, but parents in the performing arts because it, it is, um, you know, it doesn't stop at 18, let me tell you. Um, you know, it, it is a, this is, this is, the majority of my career has been as a mother, as I'm sure, not, I'm talking to lots of people here, and I'm sure I'm talking to a lot of parents here, but, but also about extending that and making sure it extends to all caring responsibilities um, is really critical. And I love the fact that you've, thought so hard about that idea of retreat, which I think also, and perhaps links to the Incart's work, but one of our, well, she's no longer a trustee now, but one of the trustees that I spoke to not so long ago, um, flagged to me the need for also for retreats for those people really on the front line of dismantling um, oppressive practice. And I thought that was a really interesting idea. So yes, skill development and confidence development, but what about people who are really on the front line of some pretty tough fights? And yes, you can be an ally, but there's a real need for rest. And, um, you know, I, so I think the idea of retreat is really interesting. Anyway, shut up. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Becky. I don't want to take any credit for the, the, the work that Swapra, I want to, it's fantastic. They came to us with the idea and we were absolutely delighted to work with them to make sure it could happen. Um, and I think that's an idea we want to explore more. You know, we have this incredible resource 
um, it is used, uh, there's a bit of a, a, a um, a fallacy that Glyndebourne is only open in the summer, which is absolutely not the case. We're pretty full on year round. But there are moments in the year where we absolutely could be working with others to, to facilitate these sort of retreats for whatever might be considered the best purpose. I'm putting my hand up like a small child. Um, I just wanted to jump in. I, I think I'm I'm. Yeah, I'm really inspired as a freelancer as well by by hearing all of your work. I think what really strikes me is um, when you're talking about reserve, Sarah and Becky, and also thinking about the word resource. And I, I think there's something that really needs to happen where we really expand that word and think about all of the things it encompasses. Because I think there are a lot of things as freelancers that we don't have access to, like stages when they're dark and lights to play with and digital recording equipment to up our practice. I was talking to a freelancer on the network recently and he said, well, yeah, I would really like to apply for all these new um, opportunities, these new pivots to digital, but I can't because I haven't had the opportunity to learn and to use the equipment. So I think there are loads of things, you know, a, a broken soundboard lying around or a spare meeting room for someone to have a meeting in. All of these things and all of these resources could be could be shared um, and I think that would make a huge difference but yeah I'm, I'm hugely hugely um, cheered by the work that you're all doing I think I want to come and work for all of you now <laughs> and just to add to your point Lily I think um, touching on the resource I like uh, your work towards community building and I think it's something that we can apply more to the on of actions. Of course, as I said, it's being developed and it will continue to be developed. And but this is an area that just hearing you speak about it now, I think we could do more of in, in terms of the thinking that um, what freelancers don't have access to is, is also the people resource of, of who you're around on a day-to-day -day basis and what that can do for your career development. I think that's very important. Yeah, thank you. Um, so just one final question from me. What are some of the things you are minded to work on next as an organisation, as a freelancer, recognising that there will always be more to do? And what has informed those choices? And Sarah, you gave us some insight to that to that pilot. Um, but if there's anything more you'd like to share, that would be great too. And Akina, shall we start with you first? Yes, um, so I spoke about the monitor strand of Arts Against Racism. Um, I also wanted to say uh, connected to making more equitable conditions for freelancers. We have a reporting mechanism that we're looking to uh, develop as well called Speak Out Safely. And just to touch a little bit on, on that, it'll be a sector wide free to use and, and confidential reporting mechanism for arts workers to be able to report on racism safely and receive support from those uh, with lived experiences and, and have their feedback anonymized. And that'll be across kind of three different levels of reporting need, just uh, sentiment and, and temperature checking. So the, these are reports not for escalation, but just for recording and then building a picture of the organization, both positive and negative experiences. And then there's the level where it requires a, a bit where the complaint requires a bit more mediation and support um, and, and mental health support as well. Uh, the thinking that we are currently working through within INCARTS is how do we make sure that this reporting mechanism also caters for those who are not um, contracted and full-time staff? How do we, there's a lot of a discussion that was happening in the workshop to build the five pillars of the campaign, but the questions were how do we, provide this for freelancers so that it's not triggering for them, for the individual to have to go back to an instance after they have perhaps moved on a couple, two, three more jobs ahead of, of the incident taking place. How can we give freelancers support and care in a very short term period? Um, and are, are there mechanisms that we can put in place to encourage organizations to reflect on how reporting processes can better apply to freelancers as well as their full-time staff. So this is something very much in early stages of development that I wanted to share. Thank you, Akina. 
Becky, can we go to you? Sorry, I am. Um, it's interesting. I mean, I'm really thinking about what Akina was saying about again about community and one of the things that we're what we're doing at the moment is we're working. Um, it's very embryonic, but I suppose it, it was just, it it does mirror a little bit about what you've been talking about, Akina, in terms of community, and um, yeah, it's kind of just making me think about our approach to that and what it really needs to look like. So. Um, yeah, I'm just kind of <laughs> mulling that over at the moment. But the other thing I was just going to say was, um, was something that Lily said about, you know, what freelancers need is um, is is an offer, is you know, and this idea of resource. And I suppose one of the things that we did in the with emergency funding, so it was very unusual, but we we offered four open commissions um, to groups of freelancers that were sort of from our stable who had lost all their work. But I think one of the things that we're really thinking about now is how to build on that, really. And the idea of the the sort of autonomy of the freelancer, you know, as regarding that as a real, that is a real gift. Um, you know, the, the familiarity that freelancers have with this idea of autonomy and self-management and is creatively, is incredibly um, valuable. I mean, on, on every level and that's one of the things that we're rather slowly I think but we are really trying to look at and think about how do we build that into our our practice more uh, in a more sort of consistent way um I guess the only other thing I was going to say was uh, again that builds on this idea of autonomy of freelancers is a real uh, gift and to take advantage of it the other thing that I'm I sort of we, we're looking at a lot more is the way that our, our network of freelancers bring their incredible networks I mean their their ecology with them but also we're, we're now beginning to look and I know again it's not um, unique but we're looking at sharing um, freelancers across organizations so we've got an organization in the southwest that we're <clears throat> sharing the employment of a, a key role um, in order to, I mean, in a way to, to really acknowledge their, well, and give them agency um, around their, this particular role, but to really acknowledge that they are the, they're the link and, and sort of really value that. So, sorry, that's a bit of a jumble of thoughts, but kind of picking up on a few things that we're thinking about and evolving. Thanks, Becky. Lily, and then Sarah. Thanks, Andy. Um, yeah, I think in terms of the East London Freelance Network, it's going to move into a new phase soon, and which will be announced um, by Stratford East. Um, my own work, I'm still focusing on freelancers and people who, who don't have access to various things. So I'm running a, a new coaching program for community artists, a free program. Um, and I think... I've been reading some of the comments in the chat, actually, um, partly while everyone was talking. And I think there is something, um, there is a, a, a big issue for freelancers is simply lack of money, um, not having enough money to live on um, and not having enough money to sustain ourselves. And, and what I would really love to see is a building of this work that, that these three excellent humans are already talking about um, more job shares, more flexible working, more part-time jobs so that people with an artistic practice or people with caring responsibilities can also take those senior leadership roles so that there is a real cross-pollination between freelancers and senior management. Ultimately, I'd like to see UBI for everyone, not just artists, because I think we need solidarity between all workers and all workforces. Um, Sadly, I don't have the power to enact that, but you never know. Thank you. I completely agree, Lily. And I just wanted to pick up on um, a quote that uh, Becky made at the beginning about adjustments to the norm should be the norm. And I think in drafting a code of conduct, so this is the area that I would really love to focus on as, as a group of freelancers and organisations, so that 
when free, freelancers are not having to fight their own battle on their own, that in going to work for organisations, there is an expectation that, that there is a new norm that we've all signed up to um, and, and certain standards that we will all commit to. And for me, that's, that's something I think is very important to be, to be working on as a priority. Thank you so much for sharing your priorities. And I'm just going to quickly recap and reflect back and then hand over um, to, to Richard. I mean, um, I suppose it's obvious to say um, that it took a pandemic to realise uh, we had a problem. And the work that has happened since uh, has been super inspiring to hear, to make an offer to freelancers, the work to um, disrupt the norm and bring about long term uh, systems change. Uh, we had some really interesting provocations about um, using reserves, creating a working environment that um, enables freelancers to be supported to do their best work um, through rebuilding community, stamina and confidence for freelancers. And, and to think about um, how we can effectively share existing resource and clearly defining what we mean by, by resource. Um, and also really clear message coming through about the need for more joined up thinking, um, more cross pollination, more building the bridge between organisations, government and freelancers. So thank you so much to all of our panellists for sharing your stories and amazing case studies. Thank you and over to Richard. Thanks very much, Sandy. Um, yeah, I'd love to, the, the, um, this recording will be online tomorrow. Um, and of course, the transcription and the BSL interpretation will be embedded in it. Our practice is that we'll plan to get um, these recordings up the day after they happen. So you don't need to attend at the time it's recorded if that doesn't suit or serve you. Um, I wanted to um, say that the case studies that we've heard today will, are being written up as a result of this conversation and will be online by next Tuesday. So we're going to create those with the speakers to support um, all of us getting even more out of those. So links, examples, tools, resources, things that they used in developing their thinking. As you can tell, Freelance Future's intention is to reuse resources that already exist and not constantly be reinventing tools, resources, reports that you've already invested in as freelancers in sharing your views and creating um, insight. So um, the other thing I wanted to mention at this time is that we've asked organisations if they might identify freelancers that, that they would like to support in their attendance by paying £250 to enable more freelancers to attend some of these sessions. We know there's a great inequity in terms of how learning gets done, depending on whether you're employed or not. I noticed in the chat that Claire is being supported by Beeford. So thank you for mentioning that, Claire. Um, I also wanted to um, thank Cheryl, Bev and Rebecca for enabling access today. Sandy, Becky, Akina, Lily, Sarah, Nayasha and Ricardo for making this a spectacular conversation. Thank you all. I um, look forward to seeing you in other sessions in the coming days and weeks. Don't forget to encourage others, invite your ecosystem, use the tools to help create change in the organisations that you're within or work with, and see you at the next one. Thanks very much. Bye-bye. Thank you.